Thank you very, very much. Uh, when I am the beneficiary of such gracious introductions, I am reminded of a story. It has the Pope resplendent in white robes and a Washington lawyer, which I was for much of my professional life, equally resplendent in elegantly tailored black pinstripes, complete with a bit of Versace wrapped around his neck, arriving at the pearly gates at exactly the same time. St. Peter ushers both in and indicates that he will see each to his respective heavenly abode. They reach the Washington lawyer's house first, and it turns out to be a magnificent 45-room manse that sits on 20 meticulously manicured acres. This revelation raises the Pope's sights considerably, and he thus is absolutely astonished just a little bit farther down the road when St. Peter directs him to a two-bedroom bungalow. Aghast, he sputters, well, but with all due respect, how can this possibly be? Responds St. Peter with great earnestness, utter sincerity, and perhaps complete truth. I'm terribly sorry, but you must understand that when a Washington lawyer arrives, we have to treat him especially well, because so few of them ever make it up here. <laughs> So now I have made full disclosure, and you are suitably forewarned about the likes of who is speaking to you this afternoon. I must say, however, that notwithstanding the reputation we poor lawyers have these days, I met a few museum directors during my tenure at the Smithsonian who could have been substituted for that Washington attorney without missing a beat. Uh, present company excluded, of course. In working our way into my topic, Native America in the 21st century, out of the myths and beyond myth, I feel a need to talk retrospectively before I talk prospectively. In other words, in order to understand the future of Indian America more perfectly, we must appreciate first, at least to some degree, the past. The multiple stereotypes and untruths, the myths shrouded in the mists of history. So before I speculate about Indian America in the 21st century, I want to begin by talking with you about the path we have traveled in arriving at the future of the first citizens of this hemisphere. In thinking about how to describe the native past, I always remember a quotation that long has been engraved in my Cheyenne psyche, lest I forget the challenges history brings us. The quotation is from a book entitled American History, a Survey, by Richard N. Current, T. Harry Williams, and Alan Brinkley, distinguished American historians all. Here is what they wrote just a little over a decade ago. For thousands of centuries, centuries in which human races were evolving, forming communities, and building the beginnings of national civilizations in Africa, Asia, and Europe, the continents we know as the Americas stood empty of mankind and its works. The story of this new world is a story of the creation of a civilization where none existed. This statement, frankly, represents the most unfortunate kind of Eurocentric myopia. And it should trouble not only those of us who are excluded from history by it, but for that matter, anyone who values the discipline of history as an indispensable tool to a more accurate understanding of the past. And I would have hoped that distinguished American historians would know better. The historical reality is that when Europeans arrived in this hemisphere, it already was the home of remarkable civilizations and cultural achievements. The late Alvin Josephi Jr., in his introduction to America in 1492, the world of the Indian peoples before the arrival of Columbus, has emphasized precisely this fact. That image, he wrote, perpetuates the myth of Euro-American superiority. It says nothing of the challenges met and overcome by the Indians as the original pioneers, of the many marvelous innovations, inventions, and adaptations that enable the Indians to live and govern themselves in America's different environments, of the distinctiveness 
diversity and complexity of their numerous cultures developed without benefit of Western European advice and assistance. As the former director of the National Museum of the American Indian, I was surprised constantly by what people did not know about the native cultural past in the Americas. The demographic statistics of this hemisphere alone, for example, would surprise many people in this room today. Specifically, demographers estimate that in 1492, approximately 75 million people lived in the Americas with some six to nine million occupying what is now known as the United States, and most of the balance residing in Central and South America, many of them in the great urban civilizations of Mesoamerica. Demographers further have concluded that of the 10 most populated cities in the world in the year AD 1000, two were located in the Western Hemisphere. I also believe that the achievements of the native peoples who lived right here in what is now the United States continue to be little understood and grossly undervalued. While many people have at least a basic comprehension of the notable accomplishments of the pre-contact cultures of Central and South America, how many appreciate the contemporaneous achievements of the Hopewellian culture in what is now the Ohio Valley? It's Newark Earthworks, each of which covers literally thousands of square feet and which stretch across miles, reflect a highly advanced understanding of geometry and astronomy. Indeed, this knowledge is fully as sophisticated as anything the Mayans knew at the apex of their civilization. These earthworks, which are comprised of geometrically perfect octagons and circles, are lunar in orientation, as reflected in their meticulous and correct alignment with the movement of the moon. The better known and nearby Serpent Mound, also an earthwork monument in the Ohio Valley, again embodies a sophisticated appreciation of astronomy. In this case, however, the orientation is solar, as reflected in the mound's perfect alignment with the movement of the sun. I believe we also should know that some 3,000 years ago, near what is now Poverty Point, Louisiana, another sun-aligned settlement existed that was seven times the size of its contemporary Stonehenge in England. The Poverty Point settlement was established, developed, and prospered, while its contemporary Rome was quite literally nothing more than a minor, largely rural, and very muddy village. I think we should know that during what Western historians call the Middle Ages in Europe, an urban settlement we now call Cahokia existed near St. Louis, Missouri, that had a population estimated at some 30 to 50,000 people. The urban landscapes of Cahokia were characterized by vast ceremonial centers, plazas, and monumental earthen pyramids that rose some 12 stories high. To give you a horizontal time reference and comparison, this metropolis of the Americas was considerably more populous than London, England at the very same time. I also cannot leave the subject of Cahokia without noting the sad reality of why we sometimes know so relatively little about these vast pre-contact cultural achievements here in North America, specifically in the mid-19th century, these vast earthworks, which dominated large portions of what is now America's Midwest, became subjects of great fascination to the non-native settlers who were beginning to populate the area in increasing numbers. Few, however, would believe that these monuments had been created by Indians, and the lost race and extraterrestrial aliens theories abounded for almost a generation. These fanciful speculations finally were thoroughly debunked by none other than John Wesley Powell of the Smithsonian Institution. And it became clear that the great earthworks were created by the ancestors of Indians. At that point, these splendid memorials to indigenous achievements of the past, which at one time probably numbered in the hundreds of thousands, were systematically destroyed in the space 
of mere decades. This anecdote actually brings me to the next subject I want to discuss in our journey through the Native American time and space this afternoon. Namely, the impact of European contact on the Native life and civilization I have just described. Without browbeating anyone or belaboring the point, the results of European contact for the Native peoples of this hemisphere were, in a word, devastating. Entire orders of civilizations and communities that had a time depth of thousands of years were destroyed and eliminated, quite literally wiped out in a generation through disease and military action. At the time Columbus sailed into our waters, historians and anthropologists estimate that the Americas were populated by literally thousands of distinct native communities, differentiated by language and cultural practice with some six to seven hundred of them here in what is now the United States. Within less than two generations, that order of cultural diversity had been reduced by more than 50%. In the same period of time, the native population in Mesoamerica, the most densely settled and urbanized of the hemisphere, experienced a decline estimated at up to 75%. Here in the United States, when the first census that included Indians was taken in 1900, their number was estimated at approximately 250,000, a decline of more than 95% from that pre-contact figure of six to nine million that I mentioned just a few moments ago. Similarly, the number of tribes here in the United States had been reduced to approximately 300. This quantitative approach to describing native history in the Americas admittedly does not capture the qualitative devastation that accompanied the numbers, or indeed caused them. Speaking for my own community, the Cheyenne, the 19th century fundamentally ended life and culture as we had known them. We were nomadic buffalo hunters, the Spartans of the plains, as my Cheyenne father delighted in referring to us. Our systematic confinement to reservations in the 19th century and the destruction of the buffalo herds, which once had numbered in the tens of millions, thoroughly disrupted our cultural and ceremonial life. Federal policy during the period also expressly outlawed the continuation and practice of traditional Cheyenne life. The Sundance ceremony, which represents the apotheosis of our religious practice, was forbidden by federal regulation. A regulation, I might add, that technically still sits on the books, although it has been ignored in practice for a generation or more. My father, at age four, was removed from his home by officials of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and he remained in federal boarding schools for the next 20 years. There, his long hair was cut. He was not permitted to speak Cheyenne. He saw his parents infrequently, and he dressed in military uniform and marched to drill at 5 a.m. every morning. In the face of the foregoing, I do not wonder that the state of Indian affairs from a socioeconomic standpoint is so dismal. I remember a time, as a young attorney, coming across something that captured in a few words this devastation and that left me sitting there, stunned and transfixed for a very long time. What I read appeared in the report of the United States concerning its compliance with the International Human Rights Accords, and here's what it said. Native Americans, on the average, have the lowest per capita income, the highest unemployment rate, the lowest level of educational attainment, the shortest lives, the worst health and housing conditions, and the highest suicide rate in the United States. The poverty among Indian families is nearly three times greater than the rate for non-Indians. Families and native, pe and native people rank collectively at the bottom of every social and economic statistical indicator. Notwithstanding this disheartening note, I now want to turn to the future 
of Indian America in the 21st century. And I begin by emphasizing, as a Native person, I am not discouraged by what I see. This position does not ignore the economic and social duress that stresses contemporary Native communities and continues today to destroy lives. Those hard realities will continue to be an aspect of Native America well into this century. I am saying categorically, however, that from a cultural standpoint, a seminal and historic shift has occurred in the thinking and perceptions of Native peoples about their future. In this regard, the point I wish most to leave with you today bespeaks for Native America not ultimate cultural destruction, but indeed tenacity, a will to survive, a capacity for continuance, and insistence by the Native peoples of this hemisphere on a cultural future. Indeed, Native communities across the United States and elsewhere are experiencing a cultural renaissance that is unprecedented in their history. We have determined finally, in terms of our own self-image and cultural self-perceptions, and notwithstanding the legacies of the past 500 years, that ours, in the end, represents a truly worthy system of cultural values and ways of life. I remember reading a passage in the introduction to James Clifford's book, Predicament of Culture, 20th Century Ethnography, Literature, and Art, that captures the essence of the point I wish to make. Professor Clifford is an anthropologist, a somewhat unorthodox and unconventional one by my reading, and here is what he said. Throughout the world, indigenous populations have had to reckon with the forces of progress. The results have been both destructive and inventive. Many traditions, languages, cosmologies, and values are lost, some literally murdered. But much has simultaneously been invented and revived in complex oppositional contexts. If the victims of progress and empire are weak, they are seldom passive. It used to be assumed, for example, that conversion to Christianity in colonial Massachusetts would lead to the extinction of indigenous cultures rather than to their transformation. Something more ambiguous and historically complex has occurred, requiring that we perceive both the end of certain orders of diversity and the creation or translation of others. Simplifying this somewhat dense, if meaty, academic prose, I believe that Professor Clifford is telling us that the native peoples of this hemisphere are still here. However stressed, and in some cases, deeply affected their cultures may be, they retain a continuing resiliency, vitality, and dynamism that is astonishing, considering what has come their way for the past 500 years. They admittedly have not remained culturally static, they have been influenced by non-native cultural forces and have even adapted, indeed brilliantly so. But adaptation is not to be confused with assimilation. The essence of indigenous cultural values continue to exist and to evolve in dynamic and culturally significant ways. I also remember the statement of an elder from the Fort Mojave Reservation in California that makes the same point in simple yet compelling terms. The statement appears in the National Park Service's report entitled Keepers of the Treasures, Protecting Historic Properties and Cultural Traditions on Indian Lands. When we think of historical, historical preservation, said this elder, I suppose you think of something that is old, something that has happened in the past, and that you want to put away on a shelf and bring it out and look at it every now and then. I was so puzzled by the whole thing that I looked up historical, and it said a significant past event. In our way of thinking, everything is a significant event, and the past is as real to us as being here right now. We are all connected to the things that happened at the beginning of our existence, and those things live on as they are handed down to us. Again. This statement eloquently confirms Native peoples as a contemporary cultural phenomenon.
that draws upon timeless traditions and values stretching back over thousands of years to respond to a vastly changed current environment and circumstances. All of the above brings me to what I call my annual November or Thanksgiving contemplations when I've been asked to make presentations just like the one you're experiencing today. In the end, my ultimate aspiration is not that you can see the worthiness, the worthiness of what Native America has contributed over thousands of years to what we call civilization, although I, of course, hope you will. Nor even that I convince you of the fact that contemporary Native peoples are intent on a cultural future, although we are. What I aspire to most today, and on all similar occasions, both as a Cheyenne and most certainly as the founding director emeritus of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, is your appreciation, indeed your more complete understanding, as you leave this place today, that this story represents a key and to date frequently misunderstood element of the collective history the shared cultural heritage, and of every person in this room, be he or she native or non-native. Even more important to me, this story offers guidance in the form of philosophies, worldviews, and social and cultural values that is relevant to the future of all of us as we make our way together, as we must, into the 21st century, where Western civilization, I believe, finally is willing to concede that it just may not have gotten everything exactly right. Where the relentless advance of technology, broadly defined, with its admittedly great advantages, nonetheless can threaten and indeed diminish life on this planet in all its variety and wonder, as well as the humanistic values that undergird and define our respect for the sanctity of that life. Let me illustrate this last point with a favorite story of mine. It is about a Northern California basket maker named Mrs. Matt, who was hired to teach basket making at a local university. After three weeks, her students complained that all they had done was sing songs. When, they asked, were they going to learn to make baskets? Mrs. Matt, somewhat taken aback, replied that they were learning to make baskets. She explained that the process starts with songs that are sung so as not to insult the plants when the materials for the baskets are picked. So her students learned the songs and went to pick the grasses and plants to make their baskets. Upon their return to the classroom, however, the students again were dismayed when Mrs. Matt began to teach them yet more songs. This time, she wanted them to learn the songs. It must be sung as you soften the materials in your mouth before you actually begin to weave. Exasperated, the students protested having to learn songs instead of learning to make baskets. Mrs. Matt, perhaps a bit exasperated herself at this point, thereupon patiently explained to them what she thought was obvious. You're missing the point, she told them. A basket is a song made visible. I do not know whether Mrs. Matt's students went on to become exemplary basket makers. What I do know is that her wonderfully poetic remark, which suggests the interconnectedness of everything, the fusion of the profoundly spiritual with the purely physical, the symbiosis of who we are and what we do, embodies a whole philosophy of native life and culture that is fundamentally different from much of European and Western social and cultural thought, tradition, and practice. The flip side of that cultural coin is that this capacity for seeing the world whole and all of the life that occupies it as valued, integral, indeed sacred, could have such salutary impact in the new millennium on broken families, fractured communities, riven societies, and threatened environments that seem to typify our times far more than they should. I also want to emphasize that Mrs. Matt's view of the world is not the mere figment of a romantic imagination. 
It is the way her forebears live for the millennia. And it is the way she lives right now in the 21st century. Moreover, it is not idle philosophizing in the abstract, but indeed has real practical impact on how she and other Native families live, how their communities function, and how they respect the natural environment they feel blessed to be a part of. In closing, I remember an occasion many years ago now at the end of one of those grinding, crunching 12-hour Washington days at the NMAI, after everyone else had left the office, the telephones finally had stopped ringing, the fax machine had ceased its interminable chirping, and both my Blackberries had been turned off. I was sitting in relative quietude, thinking about the futures of the National Museum of the American Indian, which I frequently did, and more particularly of Native peoples. As I was ruminating, the words of a favorite poem came to me, and I leave you with it now as a small but hopefully precious gift. The poem is entitled, It Doesn't End, of course, by Simon Ortiz of the Pueblo of Acoma in New Mexico. Simon, I believe, was writing of his own personal cultural survival and continuance. But metaphorically, he well could have been speaking for all of native cultural survival. It doesn't end, he wrote, in all growing from all earths to all skies, in all touching all things, in all soothing the aches of all years. It doesn't end. In the final analysis, I will not rest easily as either a Cheyenne or the founding director emeritus of the National Museum of the American Indian until every person in this room and those not here whom we represent appreciate and understand that all of us, native and non-native, have a vital stake in the fact that it doesn't end. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> We do have time for some questions. If you, if you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you so we can uh, hear you. Annie? Bob. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> My question is, do you believe this boy that you just described in our knowledge base, if American public schools taught the true history of indigenous people in America, would there be a true nonviolent revolution that would bring about peace in our land? Uh, does, can everybody hear the question? Yeah. Um, I, I would hope so. I would hope so. Uh, and I would comment on a couple of aspects of what you just said. One is that education is critical in all of this, and I mean the, in that in the broadest, broadest sense. Uh, one way that you exclude people is by excluding them from history and the discussion of it. And there's no question that that happened uh, in history. Uh, I grew up in Oklahoma, right across the border in Muskogee from Arkansas. And uh, that is a state which at the time had one of the largest Indian populations percentage-wise of any state in the Union. And yet our presence in the history that I learned going to public schools in Muskogee, Oklahoma, was not significant. It truly wasn't. Now happily, the second point I would make is that that is shifting. It is shifting. And uh, there are actually any number of states at this point Oklahoma among them, actually, but many others, that require this part of the American experience to be a matter of school curricula. And, and that, has been, uh, that has been a big boon, I think, to, to what is happening in this respect. Um, 
there has to be a way in which, the third point I would make, a way in which Native people themselves are involved in the telling of their own stories. And that's a critical dimension of this wonderful exhibit, which is just about to open right here at the Society. It was certainly key to the National Museum of the American Indian um, that we achieve that at the National Museum of the American Indian, that it wasn't just other people talking about us. It was us talking about ourselves. Uh, because we can contribute to the discourse, uh, however many parties may have a valid role in all of that. And I think that that is critical. And when that happens, to get to your point about a peaceful revolution, an orange revolution, if you will, I think that's what makes it happen. Because once you get to that point where Native people are, a full, are full participants in, in this discourse, then you reach a point where there is mutuality in understanding. And that means that there is mutuality in respect. It runs both ways. And that, I think, is where the screw actually begins to turn somewhat. Um, because then you have the basis for what, in my view, is genuine cultural reconciliation. It has to be a bilateral process. It has to be the result of dialogue between communities previously unattached or even hostile to one another. That was really my aspiration for the National Museum of the American Indian, was that it would become such a place that it was not simply this grand museum that held hundreds of thousands of beautiful, beautiful objects in its collections, but that it became a community and cultural center where there was mutual education running both ways that somehow would allow these two sectors, non-native and native, of, of America reconcile themselves in a truly profound way, ultimately. Sir? Hi, my name's Sarah Clark, and I'm a student here. And this summer, I'm doing my international project in Bolivia, where 70% mm -hmm. of the population is indigenous, and similar devastating demographic trends mm -hmm. exist, and yet they've elected their first indigenous president now with Evo Morales. Right. And I was wondering how that resonates with the native story here in the States, if at all, and, and what the similarity, similarities and differences, right. differences are between the native culture in South America and the one here in the States. Well, the first thing I would say is I would love to have the Aymara numbers here in the United States. Uh, there they constitute, as you point out, well over half the population in Bolivia. Here we constitute about one half of one percent of the population. Uh, so it's a little bit more difficult for us to achieve those kinds of political results. But I, I would say that there is much more that goes on in the way of communication back and forth. Um, it, within the native community between the United States and Canada in the north and our brothers and sisters in Native America in, in Latin America at the present time. That wasn't always true. It was again, an, it was again an, a strong effort on the part of the National Museum of the American Indian to, to emphasize that we really were a truly international institution and that we had a cultural axis, but it was not Euro-American. It did not run east-west. It was native, and it ran north to south and south to north. And so I think that there are many native communities here in the United States that have been inspired by the example of what has been achieved there. And I would point out that in addition to uh, President Morales, uh, President Toledo in Peru uh, himself is a member of the Quechua community and a, and a speaking member of the Quechua community and was elected president of Peru a number of years ago. So. These kinds of things are all happening. And I would, the last point I would make is that in some respects, they've been achieved against even greater odds in Latin America, notwithstanding their greater numbers down there. And it, it's because here in the United States, whatever one may say and whatever has happened in the past 500 years, as a lawyer, in addition to being the director, former director of the National Museum of the American Indian, I appreciate and value the legal status that Native people have in this country in contrast to what is often the case in Latin America, where um, native populations are not even recognized in any way politically. Uh, I remember being in Chile, for example, having visited the Mapuche community, which is mostly in the southern part of Chile, and then being at a very kind of upscale uh, reception that was held in Santiago, 
and having somebody look me straight in the eye and say, well, you know, it's really interesting uh, what you do in the United States. Of course, you know, we have no natives in Chile. About a third of the population in Chile is Mapuche. And, and so there, there, is this, there are kind of different blindnesses that affect different parts of the hemisphere. But there is, at this point, much greater connection and knowledge. Uh, President Morales has been at the National Museum of the American Union. That occurred not too long ago when he visited the United States. Um, and, and I think that all of those things are, are very important points of contact, both cultural and political, uh, between all the natives who originally populated the Americas. Ready? I have a question. Around the time of Schindler's List, the movie came out, they started mm -hmm. gathering uh, verbal histories yes. of the Holocaust victims. Yes. Has something been done like that, I hope, for the different tribal nations yes. with this museum? Yes. Uh, that has been done in a number of different places, but including the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, there, we face certain challenges in the, in the Native community, and they are the following. Um, we do not have histories that are necessarily written histories, but that doesn't mean that we don't have histories. Ours are oral histories, and uh, there are keepers of those oral histories, and they are dr dying and passing on at an alarming rate at the present time. And so one of the best things that any cultural institution can do, the tribes themselves can do, I think, is to try to husband the resources to make sure that we capture as many of those histories before they are lost to us. So the National Museum of the American Indian has done that generally and specifically with respect to certain projects. And it is being done elsewhere in Indian country at the present time, too. And it is very, very vital to us. It is one of the ways that we actually preserve Native history uh, at the present time. Right here. Um, Mr. West, it's a pleasure to see you again. And I Thank you. hope you're Thank enjoying you. your retirement. And, uh, yes, I am. <laughs> tell I'm much healthier, yeah. frankly. <laughs> I had, um, uh, I've often wondered, I've always wanted to ask you this question, so I'm glad I'm taking the time to do this. We had, um, for those of you who may not know, he's. Um, not only was he the director of the National Museum, which assumed a lot of responsibility that he spoke about, but one of the main things he was able to do was organize a massive fundraising effort to actually have that uh, museum constructed. And so it was, it was a, a marvelous piece of fundraising as well as a marvelous piece of architecture. Right. And uh, one of the things I wanted to know is that um, given the fact that your, much of your speech is to talk about um, the indigenous cultures telling their stories and being able to tell them to a, a, a global audience. Um, in a city where the football team is called the Washington Redskins, I was wondering how difficult it was to try to break the disconnect between the romanticized American Indian or the commercialized or the Hollywoodized or Madison Avenueized American Indian of the non-Indian's version of us and what you were trying to do and not only raising money, but gathering the artifacts and the, and the, and the cultural uh, collections for the presentations that now occupy the museum. Yeah. I appreciate that question very much. It's a very important one. Uh, I will say just as a, a brief personal anecdote and introduction to talking about the point, I, I remember in Washington, where both of my children attended uh, school gr growing up, I was frequently asked, even before I became the director of the museum, to come give the Indian talk, if you will, at, uh, during, the, uh, during the school year. And um, uh, I remember being asked by the teacher one time, um, she said, well, uh, now, do you, do you have regalia? And I said, well, yes, I, I have regalia. And she said, well, would you wear it when you come? And I said, uh, no. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to because I have different regalia for different occasions and, and uh, that you need to, your students need to understand that we occupy a number of different roles in our lives. I love my Cheyenne regalia and I highly value it, uh, but I operate in a number of different sectors in my life. That is one of the things that was most important to me about the National Museum of the American Indian. And when we did, as we did, a series of consultations for almost two and a half to three years, back at the very beginning of the museum, talking with Native communities about what they expected to see in this place, the National Museum of the American Indian, that, is what, that was number one on the list in virtually every one of those meetings. And it was simply, 
we are not dead, we are still here. And we want people to understand that. And we're not here in, in only the form that they think they know us. Um, and so that is why at the National Museum of the American Indian, if I were describing its core mission, there were about three different parts of it, but the first and most important effort was that anybody who walked through that place understand when they left that Native peoples existed across a large time spectrum, very deep, going back 15 to 20,000 years at this point and getting older all the time, but that we were still here in significant numbers. And that if you computed the native population, depending upon how the computation is being run, there are several million here in the United States, there are a million or more in Canada, there are anywhere from 10 to 40 million in, in Latin America, depending upon how the numbers are computed. And that that is, is somehow what people must understand. Now, I will tell you that the reaction uh, varied sometimes uh, at the beginning. Native people understood it immediately, and I think they were grateful for our having taken that position. There were um, others who just wouldn't let go of, of ideas that they kind of brought with them uh, when they came, and just uh, were so enchanted and, and, and lined up with uh, this romantic notion of, of the Native American that it was difficult to kind of pull them away. But, but I think that all cultural institutions that treat Native subjects at this point are moving that direction. History is on our side. We're all sitting here. You're right there. I'm standing up here. Um, it will happen. And I, th I think people will come to understand that that is, is a very important dimension of trying to interpret and represent Native culture at the present time is to make sure that this notion of contemporaneousness uh, pops up all the time. It was one of the three permanent installations, original permanent installations at the museum, this exhibit called Our Lives. And I remember we came up with what I thought was really, I loved it actually. As you walked into the exhibit, you noticed that there were people kind of in video, kind of walking beside you all the time. And, and lots of people said, well, why is it that you have uh, you know, these, these, uh, these people kind of walking beside us? Well, the point was every person in the video was Indian. And, and the notion, again, was we're kind of here. You may not see us all the time, but we're right here, and we're usually right beside you. Um, so that, that this is a very, very important point, and it was critical to the National Museum of the American Indian, which if named in terms of how it functioned and how we saw it in terms of philosophy, was actually an international institution of living cultures, in my own mind, so that it did indeed have the full spectrum of Native experience and existence represented. We do have time for one more question. When you quoted the historians who made America an empty land, Yes. I was reminded of Ronald Reagan, and every time I heard his speech when he talked about our history, the same thing. They came to a, um, an empty land. And my question is, is that what he believed, or was that politically motivated? And if so, what was he trying to do? <laughs> well, with respect to pre former President Reagan's view, I, I, of course, leave politics completely alone. I don't know why he said that. It, was, it, it reminds me, however, of a, of a less benign form of, the, of that same statement, which was made by his great good friend, um, um, oh, what's his matter with me, uh, the, uh, the super cowboy, um, John Wayne, John Wayne, I'm sorry, I, I think I was repressing it or something, but <laughs> it was the same point. <laughs> It was the same point when one time he was kind of asked a question or a similar question and he said, well, you know, the, the Indians wouldn't have gotten in so much trouble if they hadn't been so selfish with their land. <laughs> kind of thing. I thought, oh, God. <laughs> I thought, well, that's, uh, and, and so in, in, that, in, in, in that kind of context, you know, Reagan seemed fairly benign in saying that. Well, I, I think that it is, it, is, it is where we, as a big matter, and it's in, in the academy, it is in the academy, it, it's kind of whom we think history belongs to. Well, the fact is that, that um, those who have told the history uh, 
think the history belongs to them. And those who have told the history for most of the, most of the history of this country are not native people. They are non-native people. And they come out of Europe, and they're Euro Euro-Americans. So I, I, I forgive them that. But, but I do expect them to uh, let us in because we are definitely here. And I think that that has begun changing in the writing of history. I mean, uh, frankly, it's not just Native people. It's African-American people. It's women. I mean, I can remember growing up, I, I, was, in, I was in graduate school in American history uh, at, at Harvard, as, as was mentioned. And, and, you know, you looked around at the literature, and there were these great gaps of, of, of people who just apparently weren't part of history. And yet that's nonsense. That's not true. So I think that whether it's the academy or whether it's museums, all of us have an obligation. Uh, and this is, I think, an appropriate note to end on. Um, all of us have an obligation to make this history as diverse and the heritage of it as rich as this country actually is. Thank you very much. Well, we have a comment back here. She's dying to have a comment. Hi. Rick, I just want to make the um, comment that the museum is um, celebrating a huge milestone this fall. Um, the museum's NMAI Act is 20 years old. Yes. Our GGHC is 15 years old. That's our museum in New York City. Our Cultural Resource Center is 10 years old. And our museum on the mall is 5 years old. That's all happening this fall. And while we're at the Smithsonian, we have a long ways to go. But with the exhibit that the Historic Arkansas Museum is opening this weekend, we're well on our way. And I want to congratulate um, Arkansas for that. Yes, as do I. All right, Rick, I think uh, we have a presentation here. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, inviting Rick to speak here today. He's an eloquent spokesman, as you know, for Indian country. And uh, as uh, chief of the tribe, I sometimes get an opportunity to uh, thank people who have uh, honored our communities and through the work that you've done over the years. And although I know you're retired, I hope you don't stay completely retired because we certainly <laughs> need you. But I want you to accept this gift on behalf Thank of the Nation. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Great to see you. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for Rick West. Thank you all very much.